Here's what I think is happening, right? If I say royal military service to you, then partly depending upon your age, but generally speaking, the first person you would think of is Prince Harry. You would recall, for example, that footage of him when he was being interviewed on telly and an alarm went off, I think, at Camp Bastion in Afghanistan, and he tore off the microphone and legged it. Quite a beautiful moment, actually. He, to me, seemed like a proper soldier. Uh, and he was in the thick of it. He, he wasn't at arm's length. I think Prince Andrew's service in the Falklands as, as a helicopter pilot was the real deal, actually. Um, but he didn't rise to admiral through his quality of military service. So I say military service to you in April 2021. Royal military service, who do you think of first? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's Prince Harry, right? So how ridiculous would it have looked if he was the only one there, not in a uniform? Because the Queen has surveyed, in her wisdom this strange state of affairs, and she has concluded that it would just look daft for the only member of the royal family that people automatically associate with the army to be the only member of the royal family not in a military uniform at Prince Philip's funeral. Welcome to another episode. I am B, and this is the Sussex set. Yes, I'm back with another episode, and I hope you guys are well. So Friday, I woke up just like most of uh, Sussex squad in America. Woke up to the news that Prince Philip had died. R.I.P. to him. And then also later that day, it was revealed that D.M.X. also passed away. Um, Honestly, neither one of those came as a shock, um, especially with DMX, because we knew that he was on life support. And the news for that wasn't really that great at any point uh, since he was admitted to the hospital. And then, of course, Philip is 99, was 99. And he had been in the hospital. Um, and, you know, anyone that age is, is not going to have a, a long time to live, especially if they're, they're having health challenges. So, um RP to both of those men, regardless of what you think about them, regardless of, um, you know, their imperfections, the life they, they lived and whatnot. I always just kind of approach it, especially initially, from a standpoint of them having families and how I know I feel whenever I lose, you know, a family member or have lost a family member, an imperfect human being. Um, and, you know, I try to have compassion for that just because initially emotions are so raw, but, um, Twitter didn't seem to get that message. Um, so, uh, let me get into that real quick, just because the thing is we do live in a time where people's opinions, they're flying out there everywhere, all over cyberspace and, they're unsolicited, um, and a lot of times they're far-reaching. <laughs> and, you know, if anything, what Philip's death, and you could say any famous person's death, um, but but seeing the world's reaction to Philip's death, particularly on social media, it should highlight a lot of things. For the family to work on like it should be it really should be a lesson like it should be something that and not even really about Philip but more so about the family and the way that they operate with the media around these types of things uh, while I know it should be a lesson for them I know it won't be a lesson for them I know they're not going to take heed and it's that right there is the reason they find themselves in the position that they're in, which is a dire situation in terms of the level of relevance that the monarchy has to the average person, which is to say they're not relevant to many people anymore. So Twitter, you know, I, I saw a tweet that said celebrities control Instagram and Twitter is controlled by the streets. And there's even a saying 
along those lines. You may often hear people say these Twitter streets. Well, it's true. And, (laughs) you know, people on Twitter, there just ain't no filter on there. And they just were not having it. So initially, when Philip's death was announced, People, A, were not surprised, like I mentioned, been in the hospital, old. But then immediately, British media, particularly the BBC, but a lot of other media as well in England, were almost immediately trying to canonize him. And to an extent, I mean... That is sort of the way old media works, old media, broadcast media. And for really until very recently, they've been able to get away with it, despite the fact that, you know, the imperfections and often problematic aspects of that person's life uh, were very well documented. They could get away with it because there wasn't this immediate pushback. There wasn't this immediate um, exhibition of receipts to counter the canonization of the deceased. Um, And, well, that didn't go over so well. And uh, then eventually, like a couple of days later, you see people in England who see this coverage are just tired of the wall-to-wall coverage of it. I don't know if that's just a you know, function of people just wanting to watch their regularly scheduled program or the fact that they didn't care a whole lot about Philip or both maybe. But there were a lot of complaints. And as it stands today, which is Monday, turns out there were a record number of complaints, the most ever. And (laughs) the thing is, it's in relation to a person dying they just don't want any of it. So there's this immediate, so it's, there's a shift in the way the people are regarding the royal family, but then also news in general. So there's pushback on a lot of the media's attempt to extract emotion from the public. It's just not there. It's just not there. So either... Philip wasn't as popular a figure as they thought he was, or the tide has just changed. And so I mentioned DMX just earlier and the fact that he died on the same day. The outpouring of support for DMX drew such a drastic contrast to the reaction of uh, Prince Philip's death. Certainly for various reasons, DMX was an artist, Philip was not. DMX, you know, has a fan base that stretches across generations and across the world. Um, DMX was a vulnerable person. Um, He showed his emotion. He wasn't afraid to do that throughout his life. And people appreciate that. Um, And just to also just the sadness of seeing him succumb to the addiction that he had always been so open about um you know his upbringing was a a tough one um and just seeing someone gone too soon is always hard to take in philip's case the man was about to be 100 again he had health struggles um and he was also you know he's a part of a a symbol you know um, the monarchy that basically touts itself as non-emotional you know we're seeing some of the drawbacks of that uh with just hearing how Harry and Megan have talked about their experience um and of all of the royal family members he's the one who has a reputation of being um the person who tells everybody to get on with it so the people are going to regard those two men differently but even still There didn't seem to be a whole lot of love for Philip. (laughs) Um, 
And maybe that's just because, you know, most people didn't feel like they knew him personally. Again, the monarchy, they try to make themselves to be um, better than everybody else, whether they do that deliberately or not. They tout themselves as being something that you need. You need them. They don't need you. That's sort of the air of it. And so when one of them dies, except for except for Diana, and you, you realize Diana was the one that said she basically lived her life and said, I need the people. I need to be among the people. And there was that genuine relationship that she had with the people, the rest of them, girl. It kind of is what it is. I don't know if it's been that through history, but Philip is actually the first one since Diana that has passed that I knew really anything about. Like, didn't know a whole lot about, you know, the Queen Mother or Margaret or, you know, anybody except for Diana. Um the people just were on to the next thing. And of course, I'm keeping in mind that people do love Philip, you know, that are his family. But when black Twitter in UK <laughs> says we're only celebrating one life today, and that's Earl Simmons, a.k.a. DMX, you got to look into that a little bit more and ask yourself why. But aside from Twitter, even people on the street, they had some things to say. Most of them were kind things, you know, things you'd, you'd say on television uh, when something like this happens. A lot of man on the street interviews. But there was one interview in particular, just a short little interview. And this ITV reporter broke the news of Philip's death to these two women just walking by, basically. And they were so nonchalant about it. You know, I think I'm actually going to play it because I think that's the real feeling of the people on the street. Nothing against Philip, but I think it's also maybe cultural too. This whole attitude of just get on with it, you know, carrying on like you did through the blitz and things of that nature. Um, People are carrying on, girl. And, you know, this is just my own unqualified opinion. <laughs> but if you haven't seen the clip or heard it, I'm going to play it. And Philip isn't dead, is he? He is, yeah. That's what I can say. Is he? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> we should laugh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, were, were, were you just walking through the path? Or? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was just her, uh, Meghan and yeah. uh, Harry, yeah. all the gardens yeah. announcement. Uh, like oh. Sorry to break the news to you, I guess. Thanks for telling us. That's all right. Um, what are you going to do with the rest of the day? Are you going to go over, pay your respects? Or? Maybe go look at the flowers. I'll keep on walking past. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Have a nice day. So he really is there. Yeah. Sis said, we'll be all right. She must be a Republican because, <laughs> uh, yeah, they didn't hesitate. But, you know, not everybody has to just weep and moan and cry. Um, there were one there were some interviews. There was one in particular I saw of a lady who even talked about how she felt like she lost her own father. It's a weird thing to say for someone you you never met. But, hey, maybe she's a monarchist. I don't know. Even. um even the, the family's favorite son, Andrew, right? Because he's, he's out here rehabbing his image and things of that nature, using his dad's death to do that. And the royal family's just letting on the BBC's facilitating it. He said that uh, Philip was the grandfather of the nation. Uh, so maybe the lady had a point, but... You know, not to be shady, but she looked like she must have she might have been paid. That might have been a commission interview. So I don't really know what the real feeling is out on the streets of London, at least right after Philip died. Um, you don't know because the news media is going to present to you the angle they're going to present to you. So um, it's just been really interesting to watch. But it's some of it is giving North Korea, it's giving a little bit North Korea vibes, you know, with the 
the the billboards of Philip's face and dates and things on there. It's weird. It's kind of weird to see, right? It's weird to see in a country like England that you, at least up to, you know, the last couple of years, I would have thought England was progressive. Yeah, anyway, anyway. It's just weird that all so much of it kind of makes you squirmy, you know, just how the news media is handling the death of a person who didn't even pay taxes. But anyway... I'm sure Philip has a legacy that is meaningful to a lot of people along the way. And, you know, it's not all just the gaffes, even though a lot of people would make it about that first, because it is the thing that that sort of sticks out to people who may not know a whole lot about him. But what I don't see the news media talking about, and maybe I'm missing it because I don't have that news, but how his passing is the beginning of an end of an era, a very important era in the British monarchy. And I guess the reason for that is in talking about his death being the beginning of an end, well, what's the ultimate end? It's when the next monarch is in the throne and the current monarch is no longer living. Nobody wants to think about that. Nobody wants to talk about that. Um, when you look at what the monarchy is and what it supposedly means to a nation, don't you talk about it, right? Um, Think about what comes next. It is hard because you are talking about human beings who are family, again, grandparents to uh, people. And I can see how the queen is the grandmother to the nation uh, for sure. That's always a hard thing. But it's kind of like maybe this is just my American brain because our head of state is a president. We don't look at them as our grandparents and granddads and, you know, vice presidents, the grandma, the auntie, the we don't we just don't do it. You know, we always are looking about we're we're looking around the corner to see what's coming next and what that means for our country and which way we're going to lean. It's just so foreign to me. But the royal family better be thinking about that. You would think that they're thinking about it, but they're not showing you any signs that they really are. Um, Or they're just inept, that they don't even know how to handle themselves moment to moment, let alone monarch to monarch. After all, they haven't had a new monarch in the last six and a half decades. Generally speaking, I think the family interviews have been a nice touch. You know, Edward and his family... Charles making a statement, you know, just to the press and doing an interview. I could have done without Andrew's input, though. I think everybody could have done without his input. On the one hand, you say, oh, well, he's someone who lost a father. But on the other hand, you say, but he's an alleged pedophile. Where do you draw the line? And so if I'm someone who has even a little bit of power, you know, in the institution because I'm upcoming, like my time is coming. He's not talking to the public, you know. So that to me, the fact that they let him, right? Like he's supposed to be in a cave somewhere, girl. Don't be coming crawling out thinking you about to rehab your image, all right? Because the queen letting you get away with enough. But this is where you're showing that you're not actually into making the monarchy look better. You're into just basically being up to the same old tricks. Again, I'm going to have empathy for anybody who lost a parent or lost a family member, but we don't want to hear from you, Andrew. And the fact that the Royal family allowed that person to go out and speak as if his opinion mattered because even about your dad girl we don't want to hear it that showed me that they're not actually ready to play ball post elizabeth ii they're just not and i'm sorry if that sounds harsh but he shouldn't get any public time he shouldn't get any interviews on people's television people shouldn't have to look at him ever again unless they're watching 
the funeral. People shouldn't have to see him. The rest of his life ought to be spent in darkness. He should be in quarantine for the rest of his life. The way they treated Megan before the coronavirus hit, that's how they should be treating Andrew for the rest of his life, girl. And the fact that they're not shows that they don't care. And that's a problem for me. So shame on you, BBC, and shame on your royal family for that. Uh, Another thing I noticed was, you know, not too long after the passing of Philip was announced, you know, the media just starts asking about Megan. Megan's name is trending almost immediately. Part of the reason it was trending so quickly was because, and this is also not boding well for the royal family, just the average person in these Twitter streets were saying, oh, okay, so Philip passed. How are they going to try to blame this on Megan? Even if it's sarcasm, even if it's a lot of it was just jokingly tweeting. We see that it actually happened, right? Most people were just defending Megan saying, well, yeah, they're going to say something about Megan here. Uh, Y'all get ready. And ultimately, people are still, even in the British media, Fox News over here in America, I believe it was Brian Kilmeade who said something about, um, you know, Philip was just trying to recover from the interview. Philip probably didn't even know that damn interview took place unless somebody told him and forced him to sit up there and watch it. Right. Which I wouldn't put it past people to do that either. But listen, just saying. But uh, Megan's name begins to trend. And as time goes on, um, you know, tabloid news other news begins to talk about Megan until we get the news that she's not going to go, but Harry is going to go, who is there now, by the way. Uh, he's landed, was there since yesterday. But Megan, per her doctor's orders, she ain't going nowhere because she's in her third, um, third trimester of pregnancy and she's in a high risk uh, category. Also, we're in a pandemic, so no good doctor is going to allow her to go, even if, as the reports uh, were, that Megan, quote, did all she could and, you know, was trying to make her case to her doctor to go. Her doctor said, "Um, here's where you can go. You can go right to your family room. You can go in the backyard. You can go to Archie's Chick Inn if you feel like it. But what you're not going to do is go to LAX. Okay. Um, and you won't be going to LHR. You can go to the beach. You can even go to Oprah's house. But you won't be going to Windsor. And that's that. So Megan's going to be right in California and honestly no sane person should expect anything else especially after as she shared so openly she miscarried and also knowing the relationship with the British media there's no reason a sane person a sane pregnant person even if the doctor had given her a clearance would put herself through that and I'm not even I hadn't even mentioned the family It just wouldn't make any sense, given what she went through. I don't think her pregnant body would even allow her to step foot on on that island, given what her first pregnancy was like. All right. So Harry's going to handle his family, right? He's going to he's going to represent his own family right there within the royal family at that funeral. And he's going to come back home to his own family and his home where he pays taxes. Do you know what I mean? So. All the people complaining about Megan, you know, not being there. And, you know, this family has given her so much. The least she could do is show up. Honey, no, the family ain't gave her nothing but heartache. And while she may have a have had a um, personal relationship with Philip. She didn't know him that long. 
<laughs> I, don't, I hate the way that sounded, but she didn't. Um, and, you know, I know she really feels for her husband because he did. She, you know, he's known him his whole life and their relationship was a close relationship. Um, certainly she feels for her husband. Um, and the last picture that they had that we, you know, saw of all of them together was around the birth of her child after that first pregnancy. So while all of those things may be true, it makes no sense for Rachel Meghan Markle to go there in her current state. So, and by the way, Megan, just just to address the people are saying because of the family gave her so much, Megan gave herself so much, you know, Harry gave her so much in that context. And in the sense, he gave her protection. He gave her uh, assurance that he had her back uh, and he gave her a way out of that situation. Megan coming into the royal family gave herself whatever she wanted to give herself in essence, probably the most successful woman to ever marry into that institution. And what Megan was trying to give them, what she could have given them was far more valuable than anything that they would have given her, including those funky ass titles. And what she could have given them was another hundred years, an image of actually being an institution that represents more than just white people, actually representing people who look like they come from the Commonwealth. In essence, she could have given them a legitimate claim to the relevance they crave right now. But they didn't want that. They cared more about the skin color of her children. And so Megan is going to be all right. Can't say the same about them. So what else is happening? Apparently, uh, ITV is sending or has sent reporters to Montecito to interview Americans on the street, which is so silly. I don't know if it was a Daily Mail or I think it was ITV, though. Uh, and there was this lady being interviewed and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I saw Harry on the beach with his dog and I took a picture. Like, how would you like people taking pictures of you? But anyway... Um, that's so desperate. Most Americans, I won't say most, but a lot of Americans don't even know who the vice president of the United States is in any given year. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Do you know that meme of Kiki Palmer saying, I hate to say it. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. She was looking at a picture of Dick Cheney. People don't know who the vice president is. Only people, only reason people know who the vice president is now is because of the history behind Kamala Harris being vice president. Why are you asking an American about Prince Philip? Why are you interviewing Californians about the death of Prince Philip and what he means? Because he don't mean nothing over here. The monarchy doesn't mean anything over here. In fact, the monarchy is by definition un-American. So it's so desperate. Like y'all are so desperate to be near Harry and Meghan. And you really just need to cut it out. Focus on your people. Leave our Americans alone, girl. Stop trying to make us have an opinion about y'all. We don't care about y'all's monarchy. We care about the health and well-being of one Harry, one Megan, and their family. You know, people all over the world love to call Americans ignorant. And I hate to say it, but there's always a little truth in the stereotype. You could show a picture of Queen Elizabeth. And depending on where you are, people ain't gonna know who she is. A lot of people wouldn't even be able to tell you her name is Elizabeth. So ain't no point in asking any of us about Philip. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's true. Just say you want to you want to see Harry and Meghan house and go. You won't get to do it, but just say that's why you're there. I guess palaces and horses and carriages and tiaras and sashes ain't enough for y'all. Mm, 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 mm. 
But anyways, uh, let me get into these statements. Just just a couple of them. Just just Wills and just Harry's. And I'm only saying that because people are saying Will took a dig at Harry. I can kind of see it, but. I mean, I can I can ignore it, too. Like, it doesn't bother me because if 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 you're taking a dig at Harry in a statement about your deceased grandfather, it doesn't make you look like the bigger person. It makes Harry look like the bigger person. It makes Harry look sane. It makes you look crazy because Harry ain't paying you no mind. But clearly we see you're paying Harry all the mind in the world. Um if that is a dig. But, you know, I, I mean, believe it or not, I want to give him a little bit of grace. But I understand that it is hard to do that, given how terrible his track record is. And given how deliberate everybody who knows him says that he is. Words mean things. And so when you put him out there, they're exactly as you want them to be, right? Because they're, they're going to be seen and read by the rest of the world. I'm not going to read his statement in full. You know, it just talks about, you know, my grandpa and my kids and memories and things like that. But I am going to read the last bit because that's the one, that's the part where people were saying, hmm, what kind of implication is he making? And so, I, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it, but let's just explore it. The last part says, my grandfather was an extraordinary man and part of an extraordinary generation. Mm, okay. Uh, <laughs> Catherine and I will continue to do what he would have wanted and will support the queen in the years ahead. I will miss my grandpa and I know he would want us to get on with the job. I mean, that last sentence could have been left out. I mean, you know, get on with the job. It's kind of like, damn, your granddaddy ain't even in the ground yet, son. Um, I think it's the part that says Catherine and I will continue to support the queen in the years ahead because it implies that Harry won't. Um, I mean, he could just be speaking for his family. I mean, for real, honestly, he could just be speaking for his family. Um, and we know Will is not going to mention Harry by name. I mean, Harry didn't mention Will by name in his statement. I mean, I don't know. I know a lot of y'all ain't going to hear that. The problem with, uh, I'm not going to want to hear that. But the problem with Will, I think, is that he has such little goodwill in these streets um, that he has become goodwill hunting. He's hunting for goodwill. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he really is trying really hard. And it's just, you know, it's just not working uh, for a lot of the attempts. But in this one, I'm, I think I'm going to give him a, a tiny bit of grace, um, even though his track record does say he is quite petty and more than capable of trying to shade his little brother, right? I think the real, I think the real, revelation if there are any um is going to be what happens after harry leaves who's going to be saying what about harry who's going to be uh saying this and this happened or this and that was said in the press you know and how was that gonna reflect on will i'm not so much worried about this statement because it is what it is even if he was shading harry it doesn't phase Harry. You know, Harry, ha he's fully set up a life elsewhere. And here we are just one year, a full year after Harry and Meghan said, we're out. And this is the point that we know the royal family wanted them to come crawling back because they were not able to successfully set up a life elsewhere. This is not phasing Harry. The boy is Gucci. He's good. So if this is shade toward Harry, like I said, it's more reflective of Will as a person and not Harry. Because at the end of the day, it's a statement about your granddad. You want it to be about your granddad and your granddad only. 
not an opportunity for a dig. If people perceive it as that, because what my opinion of it is really doesn't matter, but if people perceive it as that, then that's on Will. He should have chose his words a little bit more carefully. But Harry's not tripping on that. And so neither am I. Harry's statement, in contrast, was a very well thought out statement. It was a beautiful statement. And in contrast to some of the things that I was mentioning in the beginning of this episode and how I felt people were reacting to Philip's death, people that knew him or knew about him and those that didn't, I think this statement does the exact opposite. And it's brilliant in the fact that it humanizes Philip as just a granddad. Yeah, he was, you know, the queen's companion, but it humanized Philip in a way that truthfully took skill or it takes skill. Um, This is one of the, another one of the instances where we see just how different Harry is from the institution that he left. He is not cold. He is very much like his mother. Um, And that empathy really does come through. Harry has a very high EQ, right? And it's not something that he built as a skill. It's just something that he has naturally. And I think it's why people gravitate toward him. So let me read his statement. It states that my grandfather was a man of service, honor, and great humor. He was authentically himself with a seriously sharp wit and could hold the attention of any room due to his charm, but also because you never knew what he might say next. Clever. He will be remembered as the longest reigning consort to the monarch, a decorated serviceman, a prince, and a duke. But to me, like many of you who have lost a loved one or grandparent over the pain of this past year, he was my grandpa, master of the barbecue, legend of banter, and cheeky right till the end. He has been a rock for Her Majesty the Queen with unparalleled devotion by her side for 73 years of marriage. And while I could go on, I know that right now he would say to all of us, beer in hand, oh, do get on with it. So on that note, Grandpa, thank you for your service, your dedication to Granny, and for always being yourself. You'll be sorely missed, but always remembered by the nation and the world. Megan, Archie, and I, as well as your future great-granddaughter, will always hold a special place for you in our hearts. Per mare per terum, which is just Latin for the Royal Marines' motto of by sea, by land. I thought that was a really beautiful touch. But I thought the whole statement was just really beautiful and just so personal. I just find it so ironic that the most human statement comes from the person that the family essentially pushed out. You see the relationship that Harry had with his grand, well, with his grandparents. Uh, But in this case, specifically with Philip, and we know Harry's role as captain general of the Royal Marines was passed down to him very proudly from his grandfather. Um, Um, People made such a fuss over Archwell and basically assuming that what they initially uh, posted as a, you know, an acknowledgement of the passing of Prince Philip, which was just, you know, you'll be missed. Thank you for your service and his dates and his, you know, title. People just love to nitpick any and everything they do. What made you think that Harry wasn't going to release a statement? And unlike Will's statement, Harry didn't talk about himself. He talked about Philip. That's what made it so humanizing and heartfelt. And regardless of what I think about them, Harry loves his family. In the James Corden segment, he talked about the queen and Philip as just his grandparents and talked about how in the Zoom calls, Philip just closes the computer and he's done, (laughs) which was which was a cute little story. Um, Harry loves his family, but he he loves his grandparents. Um, After the interview, he called Oprah up real quick and said it wasn't Philip who said that. And it wasn't the queen who said anything about anybody's skin color. But just know it was said. 
So he he loves them and protects them in ways that he really he just don't have that kind of warmth, at least it seems these days. And how could he like, how could you blame him? He doesn't have that type that same type of warmth for everyone else in the family that he definitely has for um, his grandparents and maybe Eugenie, you know, because they're close. But, you know, that ain't none of my business. But, um, yeah, I appreciated Harry's statement. Um, I think Anne had a, a pretty good statement as well. So the Fune is on Saturday, I believe, 3 p.m. Windsor time. And I guess that would be, what are they, like five hours ahead of the East Coast, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I took a little unscientific poll on Twitter <laughs> And ask, hey, are you guys going to be watching The Fune? And you said, no, ma'am. That's what y'all said. <laughs> that's what y'all said. And those of you who did, that's what the majority of y'all said. Those of you who said, yes, you said that you would be watching it, but only for Harry. Uh, but the rest of y'all said, no, I will just look out on Twitter for news and or clips uh, I'm going to be spending my time doing other things. Well, as for me, um, I'll probably watch it. It probably won't be on like television over here, but it'll probably be on YouTube on, um, you know, cause the Commonwealth is big and, you know, Canada is still, I mean, they have their own television, so they'll probably play it on TV. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't even have TV. You know, this is the new age. So um, I would imagine if anybody in America wants to watch it, it's probably on like YouTube live or um, streaming somewhere else. You could probably find it on the Internet for free. So uh, I'm probably going to watch it. You know, I tend to watch those types of things. I don't know why. Um, for me, it's just sort of like live events that a whole bunch of other people are going to be watching. I tend to watch it. So if I'm not doing anything, I'll probably watch it. Um, also, a good portion of you guys think that the royal familia is going to hold Harry hostage, like make him, finally make him a literal hostage and trap him as they are themselves trapped. Uh, <laughs> Y'all crazy. Listen, a lot of y'all, listen, we all know, we all know, we all know. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I can kind of see, I think because they went through something so traumatic, why people would think that. Um, but I just say, Harry, don't eat the food. That's all I'm going to say. You know, uh, you know, you, you've been in a, you've been in a, in a war zone. Maybe you got some MREs. You feel me? Um, uh, yeah, but for real, for real, I wouldn't eat the food. I'd make my own food, you know. Um, there's plenty of stores in Windsor. Things can be bought and acquired um, for real. But I don't think they're going to hold him hostage. I mean, Harry probably has his own team of security with him. So, you know, y'all crazy. Y'all really, y'all are really silly. But that said, you know, they, they, they have been pretty possessive. Of Harry, you know, uh, knowing he has a family and things like that. Uh, they've been, a, you know, they've been a little bit obsessed with trying to get him back. And so um, we've seen stranger things. But I don't think that's going to happen. I just don't think so. Um, not while all eyes are literally on them. Like, that would be so brazen. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just don't see it. I don't see it. So. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's y'all crazy. So Harry, just take your own tea bags and you'll be fine. You good. And as soon as the fume is over, he's going to be on the next thing smoking. You, I mean, I would be surprised if he's there for a full 24 hours after it's over. So, um, you know, the guy's got jobs. He's got things to do. And while we are so sorry for his loss and genuinely, I am sorry. For his loss. Uh, I'm very happy for him. That he has a life. To go back to where he is 
free as a bird, where his creative energies are matched and where he can sleep through the night. And so, you know, for the meantime, Harry's just doing what he got to do. And one thing about Harry, he gonna pay them respects. You feel me? Even if they mocking him for it, like they did for that whole, you know, Remembrance Day thing. He gonna pay them respects. You feel me? Um, And then he's out. Megan's probably gonna be sitting in the family room with her black on. You feel me? Um... <clears throat> Or bright blue, who knows? <laughs> let me let me stop. I'm gonna end this podcast. I'm gonna end this podcast now, uh, and say that is about all I have for today. Um, I just wanted to go on record and uh, just speak about the latest events, just because they have been so major, and um, I I you know, didn't have it in the last episode. So hopefully this podcast ain't too long, but you know what you can find me. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. Um, like three of y'all have found me on TikTok and that's okay. Cause I don't even be making TikToks. I be watching TikToks. Um, but yeah, you can find me over there too. I'll put the links in the description and thank you so much to those of you who have, who have left re- reviews um, that helps other people to find the podcast And, um, yeah, I appreciate your input. So, uh, I will see y'all at the fune and until then take care of yourselves. And so until next time, peace. I'm a bad bitch. You can't kill me. Kill me.